Hope Rugo, a professor of medicine and director of breast oncology and clinical trials education at the University of California, San Francisco's Comprehensive Cancer Center. We're going to talk about some interesting updates from ASCO 2021. And with me today are my excellent uh, colleagues, very knowledgeable and key opinion leaders in breast cancer, Dr. Jennifer Litton, who's professor of medicine and vice president of clinical research at MD Anderson's Comprehensive Cancer Center, and Dr. Bill Gratishar, who's professor of medicine and chief of hematology oncology at Northwestern University. Both of my colleagues are experienced clinical trialists uh, and clinicians in, who specialize in breast cancer. We're going to start uh, this conversation and talk about two uh, really important trials that were presented at ASCO this year. One trial in particular is practice changing today, but I think the other trial also has significant implications for the way we treat a specific population of patients with early stage breast cancer. These trials are Olympia and Neotala. And really, Jennifer Litton started the whole investigation of PARP inhibitors as neoadjuvant therapy for patients with BRCA1 and 2 mutations. So Jennifer, tell us a little bit about the Olympia trial and Neotala. Sure. So the Olympia trial was an international phase three randomized controlled trial of over 1,800 patients. Everyone had to have a germline BRCA1 or 2 mutation. And the eligibility really looked at whether they had chemotherapy up front or surgery up front, or if they were hormone receptor positive or triple uh, negative breast cancer. And basically, they had to be considered high risk with very specific definitions, such as triple negative breast cancer, um, node positive or greater than two centimeters, or you had any residual disease after neoadjuvant chemotherapy and surgery. And hormone receptor positive, if you had greater than four lymph nodes at the time of surgery, or if you had neoadjuvant chemotherapy and had significant residual disease. And really, the endpoint is uh, invasive disease-free survival. This study was stopped based on the fact that it was a very positive trial. At three years, the invasive disease-free survival was 77.1% versus 85.9% for the patients who were given one year of adjuvant alaparib therapy. And the three-year distant disease-free survival increased from 80.4% to 87.5%. I think given these findings for patients with high-risk um, early breast cancer and a germline BRCA, PARP inhibitors in the adjuvant setting are now, I consider, a standard of care. I think it will have a lot of implications for how we look at giving these drugs to these patients and also who we consider genetic testing and rethinking our genetic testing guidelines. And the Neotala study was a study that uh, it started off as just a two-month window study where we gave two, at, at our institution, we gave two months of single agent talazoprib, it's a once a day pill. And what we found was that we were having a dramatic and early response to the PARP inhibitor in decrease in tumor volume. And these were all, all comer germline BRCA1 and BRCA2. Given that response, um, instead of going on to then chemotherapy and surgery, we changed the study and changed it to six months of single agent talazoprib taking them to surgery. And there was 20 patients, 19 of which were valuable in the pilot study at our institution with a 53% rate of PCR. Now that included both ER positive and triple negative. The NEOTALA study, this is the multi-center sponsored uh, trial, looked at pretty much the same design and started off mostly as triple negative breast cancer patients. And in fact, the entire cohort was triple negative. Uh, uh, patients with triple negative breast cancer. Uh, the study was initially designed to be a single arm phase two study of approximately 120 patients. And just due to the decisions made, uh, not based on efficacy or toxicity, but during the early part of the trial, the sponsor decided to truncate this study to 61 patients. So we reported that the PCR rate by uh, independent central review for the evaluable was 45.8% and, and in the intention to treat a 49.2%. Uh, 
When we look at toxicity of both of these trials, we definitely see what we know for the PARP inhibitors. So increased anemia in the neotala that was 39.3% had grade three anemia and uh, patients did require dose de uh, reductions, delays and uh, blood transfusions in 13 of the patients. So that's some really interesting data, Jennifer, and indeed in the Olympia trial as well, about 5% of patients had at least one transfusion, the majority of patients a transfusion. But the other side effects like nausea and headaches seem to be fairly modest, mostly grade one and two, and uh, more than 90% of people were able to complete the whole year. So it definitely suggests that overall it's pretty tolerable. Uh, Bill, I think the questions that have come up are a number. Uh, one is... Uh, would you give this now to all patients who have a BRCA1 or 2 mutation, or would you limit it to the Olympia-like population? And if you do limit it, uh, thinking about the toxicity and cost, um, then do you, uh, what do you do with the other treatments like capecitabine and potentially the CDK46 inhibitor of bamacyclin? You know, at the present time, I think that I would be more inclined to follow the eligibility that were in the Olympia trial. And I think the data from that trial are pretty compelling. And I agree, it's, it's uh, practice changing. ASCO has already adopted um, that as part of the practice guidelines. And as you know, NCCN voted on that. So I think that this will be incorporated very quickly. Now, should it go to, every, should it be administered or recommended to every single patient, even with uh, very small lower risk tumors, I'm not sure that I'm willing to make that leap yet. And I'd be interested what Jen thinks about that. Sure, you know, I, I would follow at this point the, the eligibility. For me, when I'm thinking about the CDK inhibitor or capecitabine, although these are not cross-trial comparisons, nor will we ever likely get to those, I think given the impact of this data, I would choose for my patients to go right to a PARP inhibitor versus uh, the CDK inhibitor or um, or Cape Cytobine for triple negative at this time. Yeah, I would too. And I think that you could, for example, uh, sequence the abemacyclib. I'm, I'm happy to get rid of Cape Cytobine in these patients because <laughs> based on the ECOG data, it doesn't seem as though it was doing such a great job, at least in our population of patients who tolerate a lower dose than potentially our Asian uh, colleagues. So um, I, uh, I think that it makes sense to use this in the triple negative group and to sequence uh, the uh, CDK46 inhibitor after uh, PARP inhibitor in patients at very high risk, for example, stage three disease, et cetera. There's also the question, well, before we talk about that one, because there's two questions I still want to get to. One is, what's the future of PARP inhibitors as neoadjuvant therapy? I mean, it looks like if you had a, you know, stage two triple negative disease cancer and you could take six months of olaparib, I mean, or talizoparib, um, that seems like it would be a lot better than getting ACT with carbo and pembrolizumab. Well, well I, I agree. I think as, as we, it really evolved because we were listening to our patients, the idea of taking a pill once a day, not being in an infusion center uh, for three hours, you know, a week getting weekly paclitaxel was really appealing to them. It's not without toxicity and I don't want to portray it as such. But I think this would be a very reasonable de-escalation strategy because it still leaves all the other options on the table, polychemotherapy, everything after the fact as well. Um, so I think that it's gonna be some really hopefully intriguing looks as we start to try to figure out who those progressors were. I'm really also intrigued uh, by the anemia in my clinical experience when we see this, it's. A lot of patients do very well and don't need uh, significant dose delays or dose reductions, but we, in the early stage, which I saw much more than in the metastatic and BRCA stage, where we see these patients, you know, treatment naive and their hemoglobin's 12 and three weeks later it's six. Trying to understand, it's really a precipitous drop for some of these patients. And this is something I think we need a lot more investigation into is this some other biomarker that we can look to? I certainly have some ideas on that that we're looking into um, to try to pre-identify those patients who are going to get those grade three anemias. 
That's a really interesting idea because then potentially you can even use an erythropoietin type approach um, since we don't think it makes breast cancer cells grow now. So that would be interesting to see. Uh, but I think then, you know, the question is how long you treat for and what the outcome is. And uh, that's why the 60 patients are tough, but uh, hopefully uh, some of the neoadjuvant trials like iSpy2 will be able to incorporate this data as a de-escalation strategy or a personalization strategy. And then Bill, last question is really, if would you be screening now uh, for uh, somatic mutations in the early stage setting in high risk patients, or pal, you know, we get pal B two. I don't see it much though. I have to say it's pretty uncommon uh, relative to BRCA mutations. But would you use olaparib in high risk patient in that population? For somatic mutations, I don't think the data applies directly to that. I think the broader question that has gone unsaid at this point is, um, at least today, I know it was discussed when the data was presented is who should we be screening? And I think they uh, legitimately flipped the question to say, who shouldn't we be screening for these mm -hmm. mutations? Because I think now that we have a tool, meaning a drug that is applicable, whether it's in the neoadjuvant setting or the adjuvant setting, we have to know who the patients are who are potential candidates. But I don't think I would apply, for instance, the Olympia data to somatic mutations. What about uh, Jennifer for PALB2? So we don't have clinical trial data per se in this setting for PALB2. We have to extrapolate from other data that we see in multiple other studies in the metastatic setting, showing, showing that PALB2 appears to be very sensitive to PARP inhibition and DDR inhibitors, um, just similar to BRCA2. I don't think we'll ever see a PALB2 only study that will have any numbers to be very meaningfully um, I would uh, certainly promote that when we consider these trials from now on, we should consider them for germline BRCA1, BRCA2, PALB2 with subsets for somatic2. We certainly have data showing that for several somatic mutation, um, there's also susceptibility to, to these strategies. But if you had a patient in your chair today who's 34, had bilateral mastectomies with residual triple negative breast cancer after neoadjuvant therapy, uh, and have PALB2 germline mutation, would you recommend a lepra? Biologically, I think it should absolutely fall in line with the Olympia. Will we get it and get it approved and be able to that's have it covered? <laughs> Those are, but, but that's a very, am I gonna ask a patient to spend that amount of money? That is a, that's an important thing um, to do. So, so do I think it would fall in line with Olympia? My my, I I I would suspect it absolutely would. Great, well, this has been a fascinating discussion and uh, really exciting information, which I hope will continue to stimulate uh, work in the neoadjuvant setting and certainly. Uh, patients who have BRCA1 and 2 mutations in breast cancer have been waiting for this data for decades. It's very exciting to see it come to uh, into clinical practice. Thank you. Mm -hmm.